me welcome you to properly to coverage ing's pro webinar series yay, yay. all right let me introduce you to my fellow panelists coverage ing's jim Cyril and anna siri hello hello hi hi hello planet earth how's everybody doing today very well, and Jim clearly is already ready for Halloween, so that's great. <laughs> <laughs> so let me tell you how this works. Feel free to start typing your questions, ask us anything, and the reason we've decided to do an Ask Us Anything webinar is because we often get questions that are either narrow in scope, so not enough for an entire webinar, or quite specific to your particular situation. So we figured we'll give you a platform to get all of your questions answered, and we will be here for as long as you guys have questions. So please do fire away. And... Or an hour, whichever comes first. <laughs> uh, right. So let's check the questions box. And here we have the first one. I'm going to be in L.A. at the end of the month is a one-day pass for the film mart worth the money any strategies which day uh one day seems more uh geared for writers uh is the best i recently entered a contest and got a coveredly score on the script so you got a consider i am assuming uh it's not very oh a coveredly score it's not very high they've asked if i want to make the coverage available for a public view your thoughts all right so basically you want to know what to do in la uh go to the american film market and what to do with your coverage score who wants to go first jim anna um okay uh <sighs> AFM, I'm assuming uh, this this person uh, means AFM. And That's what I'm assuming as well, yes. Yeah, okay. So uh, AFM is not really for screenwriters. I mean, a lot of screenwriters come out and try to make context at AFM, but AFM is really, you know, for producers and salespeople, foreign salespeople, stuff like that. And there's certainly plenty of screenwriters milling around trying to get attention, but it's not really the ideal place for them to do that um although I, I guess anything can happen i don't know anna do you have any experience with going to afm uh, and seeing if you can meet anybody uh, i've had friends that have gone to afm but they generally only go when they have a project that they're trying to pitch or so yeah, exactly um as a screenwriter i mean it's i guess it never hurts to make contacts but there i think there are better ways to do that there are certainly cheaper ways to do that <laughs> um yeah i don't think it's it's probably not the best use of your time because you know, people go there, they have sort of a very specific agenda uh, and they don't veer off from that a whole lot. Yeah. Now, oftentimes we have clients who say, hey, I'm going to be here at AFM. Do you want to get together? So basically they're trying to fill up their time with whoever will meet them. And, you know, oftentimes that's us because we, we always try to, if we have the time, meet our clients. But in terms of actually like using it uh, for networking in the industry, um, you know, I don't think there's like a lot of managers there who are looking for new talent, unlike, say, you know, like Slam Dance or, you know, any any of the big festivals. Uh, Tanya, you have any perspective on this? I agree with everything you guys said. And I just want to add regarding the Coverfly uh, score. Uh, if it's not very high, no, don't post it publicly. Basically, you want to make a good first impression and you always want to put your best foot forward. Yeah, and just keep working on the script. You know, there, there's really no point in trying to promote yourself or your script until you've got something that is explosively awesome because you're competing against hundreds of thousands of other people. So take the time to get it right. Or, you know, the industry will still be there. Excellent. So on to the next question. I was hired to write a one page synopsis of a script that is not in chronological order, flashbacks, etc. How do I write this synopsis? Oh, yeah, this question came in a little earlier via email. So um, 
there, there's a little bit more detail to it, which I think might be helpful. Let me see if I can pull it up. Oh, yeah, this is from Gina. Uh, I have been hired to write a one-page synopsis of a screenplay that spans time, not chronologically. Starts present day, moves to, this, moves to the 60s, then to 2009, then to the 60s, then to 2009, then ends in the present day. How do I write this synopsis? Would it be easier to follow if I write it chronologically? Anna, what do you think? Um, I... I think it depends on how uh, how nitpicky the the time jumps are. Uh, if it's really diced up and it's every other scene, it might make some more sense to do it uh, chronologically. If it's larger chunks, I think cutting back and forth is okay. Uh, a one page is really it's it's a, it's a pitch document, so the important thing is that you want the person reading it to understand it. Um, most of the time, I would say you want to not spring the idea that it's a uh, that it's told that that is a script that's nonlinear. You don't, you want them to be able to get that from the synopsis. You don't want someone to read it chronologically and then discover that it's all chopped up into little pieces. Um, but uh, generally speaking, try at least try to, to 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 hint that it's that that's the the way it's written. If that makes sense. Yeah. So so I I think what you're saying is like um, if you look at Westworld, for example, you know, they're bouncing all over the place chronologically, but, you know, they, they never actually tell you that they're doing that. And frankly, it's irrelevant for the storytelling. So I think once we know what era each storyline is taking place in, we could just sort of go back and forth between them, I wouldn't recommend telling each story separately. I, it, I mean, if it takes place with lots of intercuts, I'd probably try to convey that in the one pager. But that said, I don't think we have to, you know, underline every single time jump. No, no, I, I would think that, it, you know, if there are larger portions, like something like Fried Green Tomatoes, which takes place in two different timelines. I mm -hmm. mean, you want to say that both timelines are happening at the same time, but you're not necessarily going to say, and then in 1932, and then in 2006, and then in 1932, you know, uh, that's that's going to take up a lot of space on the page, and you don't need that. Excellent. Thank you. So on to the next question. We have a question regarding dashes versus commas. Dashes <laughs> feel fast. Commas feel like a pause. Dashes are not necessarily grammatically correct, but can exceptions be made for style or pace of the read? Oh, All right. Oh, so, yeah. so here's, here, yeah, yeah. So much of it is feel, feel on the page. What feels right? I mean, there's, there's rules. Like if you look at the AP style guide, for example, there's actual rules or or, or Chicago. You know, for, and, and those rules, by the way, often contradict each other depending on what style guide you use. Um, newspapers and magazines tend to use AP. Books tend to use Chicago. But here's the deal. You know. Um, Dashes generally indicate, um, you know, uh, a, a, an interruption. Something is being interrupted, whereas um, a comma, there, there's no interruption. The, the, the flow keeps going. So um, if there's a brief pause or hiccup, but you, you, you know, in other words, an interruption, either in dialogue or in action that's being told, uh, use a dash. I use them all over the place. Uh, I hate ending sentences, especially in action sequences. This is a technique I stole from William Goldman. I mean, you want to keep the reader breathless and, and keep them going. And it may not be grammatically correct, but uh, who cares? The point is to just keep them turning the page. Um, you guys want to add anything to that? Uh, yeah, I, I love dashes. I, I use way too many of them. <laughs> um, I think, uh, yeah, everything you said is, is right. I mean, as long as you're not you just the, the, the end goal is that you just don't want the reader to stop and go, oh, that looks weird. That's all. Uh, as as the flow on the page is good, then it's all good. Yeah, absolutely. I couldn't agree more. Um, and to answer another quick question, yes, you can uh, ask as many questions. Type them into the questions box because we just got a question. You can ask as many questions as you want to. Just you know, keep finding that questions box and type in questions. All right. Uh, next question. I understand in order to acquire an agent, one must have multiple scripts completed. I have just uh, completed my first and have no plans to write another. Is it realistic to team up with someone who already has representation? Can you recommend a means of tracking down writers who have experience working with specific directors? 
Oh, okay. I, I, I kind of feel a little bit of a rant coming on here. So um, let me, a, a, as gently as possible, try to try to address this. Um, basically, the industry is looking for writers who are not one trick ponies. Um, you know, they, they want creatives to have a wealth of material, wealth of ideas, and to be able to give them two to three specs a year whether you're a TV writer or a feature writer, that is the expectation. So if you get signed by a manager, I mean, the number one way that writers who get signed lose their representation is by not generating new material. So um, perhaps this person who is asking this question understands that that is a weakness and is looking to you know, kind of bolster that. That's great. And if that is the case, then probably the best place to find someone who can kind of augment you, um, I'd say would be look for a writing group. Um, you know, there, and uh, I don't know where to find those places, maybe Craigslist. Um, I found my writing group through UCLA, uh, you know, taking classes and stuff. Um, but I'd say be prepared that, you know, if, if you have one idea, you probably shouldn't be a writer. Um, you know, maybe you're more of a producer. I don't know. Anna, what do you think? Um, I mean, I've worked with a partner and I've worked without a partner. I, I think, um, I think you're right. Yeah. You know, if you, if you only have the one idea, then th th this might not be the career for you, <laughs> but that doesn't mean that that's, that's not necessarily true. I mean, if you're very passionate about this one project and you want to push it forward, that's great. Um, there's nothing wrong with seeking out a writing partner. I think it might be difficult to find someone who's already established, who wants to partner with someone yeah. who's doesn't have a whole lot of experience just because you know someone who's already established has already put in all these years of uh, uh, writing and of uh, planning and rewriting and making the connections they need to connect they need to make so you have to make sure that you know just like any other partnership that you're both bringing something to the table so uh, you'd have to be really clear about what you're bringing to the table in addition to what you're getting out of it uh, I think Jim's right finding a writing group is usually a great way to go uh, if you really love the script that you're working on, you can also um, start trying to figure out how to get that project going on its own, or you could transfer it to another medium. I mean, self-publishing is huge right now. It might make a great book, and you don't need anyone else for that. Uh, but yeah. But bear in mind that you know, finding someone, you know, water seeks its own level, and, and finding someone who is at your level uh, and you know maybe has some uh you know some hustle and some other ideas might be a better fit than trying to find someone who's established because you know look we all only have so much time and we all have our own projects and ideas that we're working on so if you're asking someone to come along and work on your ideas um you know that person is not going to be able to be working on their own ideas or or you know they'll have less time to put on into it so you know one needs to be realistic about what you know how, how a partnership works there's got to be some give and take right excellent um on to the next question how do you make a synopsis interesting do you follow any specific <laughs> format <laughs> this is that's a good idea. my synopses are terrible <laughs> all of them they're too long <laughs> Tanya, you are great at synopses. What's your perspective on that? Ah, what's my uh, perspective? My perspective is that the, the, the most important part is that you get all the major events in. Don't get caught up in the minutia of this person, you know, thought this or did this or, you know, sat there staring out the window. Make sure you get all the major events in. Make sure you know what the theme is and always hark back to the theme. Always hark back to what the overarching story, the overarching character arc is. But yes, you can be, um, uh, yeah, be judicious. Again, most stuff doesn't need to be in the synopsis. Make sure you just, essentially, a, a synopsis, I compare it to a quick short story or a quick anecdote. You're not, you know, telling the life story. So just stick to the major events. That's great. Yeah. Um, I would say also one, one additional thing I like to do is try to put as much panache 
into that synopsis as possible because you're not just trying to sell your story you're trying to sell yourself as a storyteller so the more verve the more like whatever is your writer voice bring it times 10 on that page you know if if you have a comedic voice for example make sure that that is in there like loud and clear from jump because that's you know that's a uh, 80% of the battle right there is uh is you know lulling people into this sense of security that you know how to tell the story and tell it well excellent so the next question is about reading draft versus production draft is there a difference? Can a reading draft move the same scene through rooms, locations with a simple all caps line rather than slowing the read through slug lines? Anna, you want to take that one? Um, I think he's talking about full slugs versus mini slugs, um, which, uh, yeah, if you're moving, I mean, production drafts and reading drafts are slightly different. You know, I mean, production drafts will have scene numbers, they'll have, uh, you know, technical elements like camera and editing instructions, that sort of thing. Um, no matter what draft you're working on, you definitely want to have some kind of slug line or marker between locations. I mean, that that doesn't change no matter what you're doing. But I would suggest using mini slugs, which basically means like if you're in a house, you would say interior house day, and then you could move from the kitchen to the bedroom to the bathroom without putting the full slug line in between all of those things, just having the all caps to delineate the room you're in. Yeah, uh, the, the rule of thumb is once you're in a master location and you've defined the master location, you can move around within that location using mini slugs, just like Anna said, like you just put in all caps on its own line kitchen once we've defined that we're in the kitchen and then you can move to the foyer and then back to the kitchen just using mini slugs it's a, it's a form of shorthand but beyond that as far as i'm concerned shooting scripts are pretty much exactly the same except for the scene numbers and the occasional camera direction uh as as uh, as specs am i not right you're yeah, absolutely yeah. correct yeah excellent so on to the next one is there somewhere to obtain a list of managers who accept unsolicited queries? Yeah, sure. So there's this great book called the Hollywood Screenwriting Directory. Everyone listening to this thing, if you don't have this, go get it. It's only like 20 bucks or 25 bucks. Uh, you could get it at writerstore.com. It's a great resource. Please don't give your money to Amazon. They're a horrible company. Writerstore.com has been servicing screenwriters for 30 years. Uh, wonderful place, wonderful resource. They've got every screenwriting book ever printed. And this particular one, um, it is a big, thick book it is well researched. I think they come out with it either annually or maybe even twice a year. So it's always up to date. Um, and in it, you know, they give you detailed information of who's at each company and who generally will read specs, uh, unsolicited material, and who won't. That said, you know, I always say roll the dice. You know, even if a company has a policy of they won't look at something, if you can get the number of the low, or I'm sorry, the number or the email of the lowest person on the totem pole at those companies, don't be afraid. I mean, if if you've got a great query, and by great I mean tight and brief, uh, and can be read in 10 seconds, which is the amount of time that they will give you before they press the delete button, don't be afraid to cold contact these people because if they spark. To your email if there's some real if there's some incredible voice or verve or panache or an idea that's just the bomb there they'll go ah eh, sure because i mean it's these people's job to read i'm talking specifically the lowest people on the totem pole at management and production companies and let me also just interject here that as you know we do look at your query letters for free so feel free to send them our way and we will give you our input Cool. Yeah, I would, I would also suggest uh, the other tactic that's always, that's always worked for me, at least, is um, a subscription to IMDb Pro. Uh, if you look up the, the writers for the movies that are closest to your script uh, in terms of budget, et cetera, et cetera, you can usually figure out who their managers are. And uh, it really never hurts to send somebody a query. Uh, they have, you know, IMDb Pro has, has email addresses. They have phone numbers. You can see who's been fired, you know, all that, all that okay. good stuff. So that's yeah. another that is true. It is $129 a year, though, so just FYI. Excellent. On to the next one. 
What's the difference between animation and live action? <laughs> well, animation is animated. Next question. <laughs> um, on the page, there's no difference, pretty much. Um, at least in terms of like a spec script. Yeah, in terms of a spec script, there is no difference, except with animation, um, you don't uh, have to be as, as you know, budget conscious because when it comes, for instance, to locations, uh, since you can, drawing them takes the same amount of effort and money. We, uh, a while ago, we actually had a live action script that we then converted to an animated script. And the first thing we did was go, ooh, a waterfall in this office building would be great. You know, basically, they can draw whatever you can write. So that's the one big difference. Um, on to the next one, how to get writing assignments. Let, let me just throw one more thing into the previous question, which is, um, I'm not quite sure exactly what the questioner uh, was asking, but if if the questioner is asking about in terms of trying to sell the material, then let's just throw this in there, which is um, animation as spec scripts are a tough sell, uh, or they're, they're tough to get people to read, mainly because most animation projects are developed in-house by the big animation production companies like Blue Sky and Pixar and blah, 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 blah. So, um, you know, they have their own slate, and it's very rare that they'll read something that's coming in from outside. But that said, it does happen. And if you've got a great animation spec, you can get um, managers to read it. Um, in fact, I, I, one of our clients actually broke in with an animation spec. Nothing ever happened with it, but she did get a manager off of it. And ultimately, that's the goal, since most specs that you write, uh, you know, ultimately wind up just being calling cards anyway. Okay, on to how to get writing assignments. Anna, you want to jump in on this? No. Um, that's well, there it's difficult. <laughs> um, sometimes you know, there's a lot of different ways to get writing assignments. I think the um, the one that seems to be the most prevalent is that you write something that somebody really loves, but they're not going to make that script, you know, but they like you as a writer, so you might get recommended to to be brought in to uh, you know pitch another assignment, for example. Um, that seems to be the most normal way to do it. You know, it's, it's tough to do, I think, as a new writer. It's another one of those things that just, you know, you're more likely to get an assignment once you've just been established a little more. Uh, it's, uh, I don't know, Jim, you've got a little more experience with that than I do, I think. Yeah, so um, you're exactly right. And this is, this is how it works, guys. So, um, you know, when, if you're lucky enough to have a script that goes out to the town from, uh, you know, a manager or an agent or both at the same time, even better, um, what generally happens is uh, you get a bunch of what's called generals, which are just meetings. Um, and they're, they're, hi, how you doing? Nice to meet you. We read your script type meetings. We can't do anything with your script, but, you know, we thought that there was some talent there, so we wanted to meet you. Um, so at that point, what happens when you go on what's also known as the bottled water tour and you get your 10 or 20 or 30 meetings or however many, you know, producers that you go and meet with, your goal is to then, you know, say, say to these people, not directly, but you're, you're re representing yourself as a person who can jump in and rewrite all their stuff that is sitting on the shelf that needs a rewrite. That's really your goal going into the room. And also to potentially pitch them on other projects uh, that you've written that, or to just see what they may need help with in general. But really what it comes down to is every production company has got stuff that's sitting on the shelf that is for whatever reason dead at the moment. Uh, you know, they had three or four writers on it. They couldn't figure out how to solve the story problem. And they said, screw it, we'll just put it on the shelf and forget about it. And if you're cool and you're interesting and you're like, hey, how's your, what, what are you guys working on? What's on your slate? And they say, well, you know, we've got this zombie thing. It's just not going anywhere. And and you just sent them your zombie script, and they liked it. But they, but you know, they're they're not going to buy it. But they know you can execute a zombie script pretty well. And you can say, hey, well, that you know what? Uh, why don't you send it over to me? Let me take a look. Maybe uh, I might have some ideas for it. And they'll go, okay, sure. This is how you get writing assignments. You come back to them and you pitch them your idea for, you know, I got a take on this, guys. I think I might be able to nail this. And 
maybe they'll come up with a couple of bucks, but probably more often than not, they'll just say, look, we can't pay you anything, but if you want to take a shot at rewriting it, then, you know, and you do a good job, then we'll get behind it and champion it. And basically what that means is you doing a lot of work for free, but this is what you kind of have to do to establish yourself as that cool, easy to work with person that the industry is looking for. Once you have that script and you deliver it back to them, if you've done a good job, then that production executive uh, who you've met with at the company will hopefully then get behind the script and, you know, try to get you paid and try to get it set up. That's generally the way a new writer will get a writing assignment. Excellent. Are there ways around writing a true or semi-true story that may have been featured in the news recently or a hundred years ago without landing copyright from a particular family or organization? Um, well, if it happened a hundred years ago, you probably don't have anything to worry about. Um, there is a general idea that if something is a public figure, it's it's public domain and therefore can't be copyrighted. You it does get a little tricky when you get into people who are still alive and there are life rights to worry about. Um, the simplest thing to do is to fictionalize it in such a way that it's pretty obvious what you're talking about, but it's not actually a thing. I mean, Law and Order does that pretty much every week. Um, but, you know, it's just a question. I, th I think it's a, it's a very individual, depends on what you're working on. Like if you want to write about Teddy Roosevelt, go for it. No one's going to no one's going to sue you over that. Right. But the, but the tricky bit is you need to be careful of if you're using uh, reference works like books, for example, uh, and you're reading a book about Teddy Roosevelt and you're getting a lot of your information that you want to inform what you're writing about Teddy Roosevelt, not just some newspaper article from 1887 or whatever. Uh, then that stuff that's in the book, if it's a more contemporary book, is going to be, you know, that writer's intellectual property and you can't use that without getting um permission i, I seem to recall this happening with a lindbergh based project uh, about 10 or 15 years ago or so where some writers wrote something some, some lindbergh based story but uh you know part of it was based on a, a well-known lindbergh biography and um they had some rights problems with that right i mean there is also the option of um emailing the book, whoever wrote the book that you were basing, you know, the bulk of your research on and saying, hey, I'd like to adapt this. Can we come to some sort of understanding? I mean, I've made short films and other things doing that. A lot of a lot of writers are amenable to that idea, especially if the book is not brand new and hot off, you know, hot, hot off the presses and on the bestsellers list, that kind of thing. Um, Hollywood tends to like stories that are based on source material anyway. So yeah. it would not be the worst idea. Yeah, it's a great it's a great idea though, and and you're definitely on the right track. So um, yeah, by all means, look for those great true life stories. Um, more contemporary, the better, since people still you know tend to hate period pieces. So sad. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. True. All right, moving on. There seems to be conflicting ways to express a montage on the page. What are your preferences? Well, um, okay, so yes, there are conflicting ways and ultimately everything when you write comes down to clarity. You know, nobody really cares if you're following so-and-so's structure method or, you know, whatever, just as long as it's clear and it makes sense. Uh, some people like to bullet point their montages, some people like to number them, some people, um, you know, some people just write the word montage at the top and then end montage at the bottom and then write a bunch of stuff in the middle. Um, you know, I, I like to enumerate, I mean, not specifically with numbers, but I, you know, I like to call every shot in the montage and just make sure that they are separated <clears throat> with a space between each one so that it reads on the page exactly like a montage, um, as opposed to a series of shots, which I do specifically enumerate. Um, but, uh, Anna, do you have any other perspective on that? I mean, I... I get a little fussy about it. I like, I, I mean, I like series of shots I think of as, you know, one, two, three, four, five, and it's, or A, B, C, D, E, and they're, you know, very specifically spelled out. Montage, yeah. I tend to like them, um, uh, you know, title the montage, and then just, you know, it's each individual slug line with what happens underneath, and then end montage when you're done with four or five or whatever. Exactly. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah I mean, 
way to as with it. anything with screenwriting, you know, your goal is to replicate on the page what the viewing experience is going to be like. Uh, that right. that's what I always shoot for. So you know, try to present your information visually, since that's what movies are. Right. On to the next one. Can you please explain more about self-publishing and possibly <laughs> converting? Yeah, Anna, that is your uh, domain. That's and amazing. possibly converting with significant changes in formatting, I'm sure, a current one-hour drama into a book. I have 12 total hour-long episodes for plenty of additional material, including a lot of soap opera drama with the primary character, some of which might fit into a book uh, with, I'm sure, tons of changes. That's interesting. Um, the good thing and the bad thing about self-publishing is that there aren't really a whole lot of rules, um, which is great because you know it's nice to have that freedom of movement to be able to just put stuff up there. Uh, the bad part is that there are no rules, and therefore you, there are hundreds of thousands of books out there that are really should not be out there. Uh, I read somewhere that I think Amazon gets um, a new book every three minutes or something like that, uh, which is, you can, I mean, do the math. It's madness. Um, in terms of adapting your own stuff, it's, it's a good idea. I do think a lot of, you know, a lot of screenwriters now are writing books so that they can have that source material, build up a fan base, all that good stuff. Um, there's nothing, there's really not a whole lot in terms of uh, structure or story. I mean, you're writing prose instead of screenwriting, but structurally it's sort of the same. You want to make sure you have a beginning, a middle, and an end. Uh, you want to make sure that your character has an arc and that the story wraps up at the end of uh, whatever book you're writing. So if you have a, um, a 12 episode series and you think each one of those is going to be a book, it just needs to make sure, you need to make sure that A, there's enough material within that first, um, within that first book, that first uh, episode to be a whole book, you know, or you may have to combine a few things. Um, there aren't a lot of rules. Like, I, I think you can very much approach it the way you do screenwriting. That's kind of how I approach it. Like, I like Hero's Journey. I like sort of classic structure. Everything I write has a sort of linear beginning, middle, and end. I'm, I'm a very meat and potatoes kind of writer myself. <laughs> but, the, but the publishing process is not hard. I mean, there's a whole bunch of different places you can take it. You know, Amazon is the classic, um, but iTunes, you can publish on iTunes. Uh, there's uh, Smashwords is really popular. Uh, Barnes and Noble is mostly going away, so you can't really do that anymore. But there's, you know, there's hundreds of different places. There's also a whole bunch of small presses that just focus specifically on on uh, ebooks and they take they're open to submissions as well so it's it's not a difficult process but again don't submit anything that you would that you wouldn't want you know everyone in hollywood to read pretty much just like anything else you'd never put a script out there without proofing it's the same thing with a book i would caution for those of you who um have self-published or have your own book and are thinking of adapting it into a screenplay or or pilot that's great by all means go for it but um probably one of the main issues that we see over and over here is um adaptations from books that you know only go uh they, they take baby steps in the adaptation process and basically they're sending us their book in screenplay form uh, yeah. And screenplays and books are very different animals. And if you're going to transfer from one thing to another, you need to take the time to specifically rethink and recreate it because all that wonderful prose uh, and all those subplots that were in your book, they have to go away if you're going to be doing a screenplay. There's more latitude for subplots in a pilot, of course, but still, you know, you need to understand that they are two very separate animals and you can't just cut and paste text from one into the other. It won't work. I, I do think it's easier to go from uh, screenplay to book, though. I mean, I think you're absolutely right. I think that the structural demands of a script are much, much more, are much stronger than um, the structural demands for a, for a book. So if you're transposing from a script back into a novel, you're going to have a lot more leeway in terms of, you know, writing as much as you want on the page. If you're going the other way, then, yeah, there's going to be a significant amount of a significant amount of streamlining and, and editing out. Yep. Great, on to the next one. Is there a checklist of ways or an expert that we may run an idea by who could help us decide if a story idea is marketable? Oh yeah, 
email us of course (laughs) (laughs) that's that's what we're here for so um we do we do this all the time advice is free emails are free so just email us info at coverageinc.com if you've got a couple of ideas um basically our uh, you know anything that takes us 10 minutes or less to respond to is free so just email us and we'll be happy to tell you um i talk to and interview agents and managers all the time it's what i do uh so you know keeping keeping our ear to the ground uh and getting the pulse of what people are looking for and what's sellable what's not sellable that's that's kind of our thing and also let me just jump in here in case you have a manager or an agent you will want to run uh ideas by this person first before you put oh, pen to course. paper so to speak oh yeah absolutely thank you tanya yeah no um especially if you are represented by all means use that person you know that's i i've heard time and again from from my uh, agent and manager friends it's one of the things that drives them most crazy is when a client comes in they haven't heard from a client in months and they come in and they're like here's my new script and the manager goes oh i didn't even know you were writing this uh it would have been nice if i had had some input into it i mean these people are there on your team use them they like to have input because it makes them feel ownership of a project so uh use them not only will it make your material more sellable but it'll make that your representative more interested in helping you sell it excellent speaking of uh managers and agents the next question would you recommend to writers trying to break into the biz to first try and get a manager or an agent? A manager. Next question. <laughs> you might want to explain that, Jim. <laughs> uh, okay. Um, there, I, I have a video up on this topic. Um, it's on our it's on our web page. Just go to coverageinc.com uh, and go through our videos page, and you'll find it. Basically, um, it, it, okay. Look, agents. Do not sign you or, or okay you do not get an agent okay an agent gets you and there are exceptions to this rule but generally how it works is agents if they're any at any level of realness they don't care until you reach a point where you've got enough buzz you've got enough going on in your career you've sold something you're working with an with an interesting producer you have a director on board your project uh your web series is getting a, a lot of play a lot of hits there's something happening that is going to make an agent pay attention you sending out query letters or or something like that is not going to make an agent uh, pay uh, pay attention. Um, you get great scores on blacklist. You know, agent will pay attention to that. They you know they have people at the big agencies, uh, junior uh, assistants and stuff like that, whose job it is to track these things. Um, so it, yeah, but but here's the deal. But managers, their job is to find and nurture and develop new talent. They're the ones who do in theory, have to read. Now, granted, there's a lot of managers who don't bother to do that anymore. It's really only, you know, emerging managers, junior managers who have to put feathers in their cap. Uh, Once you actually get to the point where you're really well established, you tend to read less and less because you're just, you're so busy servicing your clients and your clients are always sending you new drafts and you've got to work with them over draft after draft after draft. And, And there's only so many hours in the day. But emerging managers, that is their job, to find and nurture new writing talent. They tend to be much more accessible than agents. Again, there are exceptions. There are some junior agents, someone who's just been promoted to the agent desk, for example. Maybe they've only got uh, eight or ten clients. Uh, So, you know, if you get in at the right time and happen to know that there's somebody who is about to get promoted um, and, you know, they're looking to hip pocket people right now, then go for it. But in general, it's always going to be a manager who hires, uh, who, who signs you, develops you, introduces you to the town, gets a producer on board your project, sends it out, and then you get an agent when other things are happening, an agent will come aboard and ride the coattails on the project. Excellent. Jim, I think you should explain the term hip pocket because they might not have heard that. Sure. So hip pocket means um, when you're unofficially signed and it's a great place to be. A lot of people think it's like, oh, I'm hip pocketed over at so-and-so management company. It means they don't really give a crap about me. Well, that's kind of true, but but it also means that someone is willing to take a flyer on you, even though you haven't proven yourself yet. Um, It just means that 
let's if you get hip pocket hip pocketed by a manager or an agent it means you're not officially a client of that agency you're not going to appear on any of their lists as a client okay but the manager or agent is working with you they will take your calls usually they will respond to your emails usually and they will help you develop material and they will send your material out there it's sort of like an interim step to getting signed by the agency if someone if someone real offers you a hip pocket situation and they say look i can't i can't sign you right now um but i'd love to work with you that means you're being hip pocketed take it it's awesome at the, and at that point you're you should be like thank you sir may i have another and be the coolest easiest to work with person that this agent or manager has ever experienced be that you know ready to go get them do whatever they say and, and appreciate their input and everything they're doing for you because eventually they will see that and you will get signed Excellent. On to the next question. Do you need to live in LA to have a screenwriting career? The answer is you you used to, but not so much anymore. Thankfully, there's this thing called the internet. Um, and you know, there there are agents and managers out there who are specifically they have an ear ear to the ground looking for talent all around the world outside of LA. So that's a good thing. But but bear in mind that, you know, once things do start happening for you career wise, you probably are going to have to fly to L.A. for some meetings. Excellent. All right. Do scripts based on true stories have a better chance of getting noticed? And how close to reality does it have to be? For example, if a script is based on a family member, but the events are fictional. Hmm. Anna, you want to take that? Um, if a script is based on a, a like a, a a family member of the writer or a, a famous family member, <laughs> um, that's an interesting question. I I'm not sure. Um, anything that is uh, source material uh, source material that's accessible is always more popular than something original, unfortunately. Um, so anything that's based on a true story or a true person, especially for period pieces, um, if it's accessible history, if you say, I'm going to write a Frankenstein, everybody knows what that is. Um, and that helps because there, there might be an audience already for that. Uh, in terms of modern modern things, you know, if we're talking about just kind of general, general storytelling, uh, I don't know if true stories are necessarily more popular if they don't have that automatic that automatic fame element to them. If it's if the writer's talking about a you know they want to write the story of a family member, uh, it's not really necessarily going to have that kind of like original that or sorry that um, that um, instantly recognizable accessible thing unless the family member was famous and did something you know notorious or nefarious or or something like that. So exactly uh, yeah. That's not make a difference. Yeah, so so when it comes to source material, um, the, the, you know you got to sort of keep in mind that um, if people have heard of it is really the metric that you need to judge it by, because you know if if your source material is uh, you know my my buddy Joey told me the story of what happened to him one day down at the store, that's not really source material anybody gives a crap about. That's just an idea for a script that you're going to go write. With no disrespect to anybody, it could be a great story. But in terms of it being, quote, source material, unquote, that means in general it's out there in the public way or it has some import to it or, you know, historical significance or something that has, you know, reason for people to be interested in it intrinsically. Great. On to the next one. When writing and submitting a synopsis for a crime, horror, or thriller script and receiving the question, why is this story relevant today? Why do we need to see the story today, right now? How does one go about answering such, such questions of relevancy for stories with those types of genres? Ooh, good question. I like that one. <laughs> Tanya, you have any uh, you have any uh, feelings on that? Do I have any feelings on that? Well, um, you can always. What is your theme? Because everything has a theme, 
even a, a right. horror script has a theme, a thriller has a theme. So go with theme. For example, if your theme is, um, well, we're living, for example, we're living through a moment of, you know, time's up and me too and female empowerment and women finding their voice. So if you have a horror script with a female heroine who finally confronts the person uh, that the guy who has wronged her so badly it's like yes it goes to it's very zeitgeisty it goes to you know it speaks to the current moment so focus on what your theme is what is your protagonist's character arc yeah that's great yeah i i i would add anything that that speaks to the human condition in any way of what's what's relevant now what's going on now you know like sci-fi for example is always great in that it often tells these thinly veiled stories uh you know like star trek did you know regarding back in the day in the 60s that you know is telling stories about the vietnam war and you know gunboat diplomacy and things like that all within a sci-fi context so it, that was relevant in that day because it was specifically speaking to issues that were prevalent at the time. Uh, and regardless of genre, you know, uh, horror or whatever, you, you can do that. On to the next one. Do you always work from a beat sheet or outline, or do you sometimes start riffing on an idea and see where the characters take you? Anna? That's interesting. Um, I like outlines. I'm a, I'm a fan. I. Sometimes they don't, I'll find as I'm writing that they don't go, the story starts going in a direction I hadn't anticipated and I have to switch it out. But I like to start with, uh, I'd like to start with the beats. I think the longer you've been doing it, the more sometimes that outlining becomes internalized. Uh, sometimes I won't write it down, I'll just start because I know where the beats are supposed to hit regardless. Um, but I know some writers that don't, that don't outline at all, you know, they have, a handful of scenes they really, really want, and they'll just they'll put them up at random and then figure out how to link them together. So I think it, it's a very, it's a personal process. You know, everyone's going to kind of approach it differently. I really like to write sort of long stream of consciousness babble when it comes to figuring out my characters' backstories. Oh. Um, I really enjoy that process. Just you know, figuring out who my character is and. You know, I'll I'll just kind of just submerge in that in that person's life and stream of consciousness, just spew on the page things that happened to them in the past, or um, you know things that they've said, important life events, you know things that that they tend to say over and over, what their philosophies are. I just kind of spew it all out. I, I might have a vague idea or or even a solid idea of what the structure for the story is going to be. And that might have to be malleable depending on where those character journeys go. But I do like the process of doing that because I find that the characters always tend to tell me, um, you know, what the story and what the structure wants to be. And that may differ from what I previously had in mind. Excellent. Uh, here we have a suggestion. Uh, somebody said that uh, we should consider setting up a similar featured writer screenplay section for actual established um, writers management uh, like Inktip does uh, without the high price tag. Um, <laughs> Um, so uh, let me explain why we actually don't do that because you know a lot of places like uh, Blacklist have the oh this is our featured script they're moving up in the ranks and so on and so forth but actually the reason we don't do that is because our entire focus is on helping people empowering writers helping them become the best writers they possibly can be and improving their scripts and their craft. And often I think a lot of this, oh, I'm, you know, trying to really focus on selling this idea uh, will get people to stumble when it comes to, okay, let me, you know, write my 20 drafts and make sure this is solid. And also often it seems people actually feel intimidated and uncomfortable about having their scripts out there so publicly uh, hence that's why we actually don't do it uh, Jim Anna do you want to add anything to that yeah no that's exactly right and also um, you know we're not a management company we're not really that's not really our strength you know it's, it's not really our gift is to go out there and and do that type of thing um, 
you know, we're we're really about um, you know just trying to help you make your, your script the best it can be. Um, and so while you know Blacklist and uh, all these other places, uh, they, they they do exist. And while they are expensive, you know, look, they're they can help you. You know, Ink Tip. Um, you know, if you're looking for a certain kind of producer, specifically, you know, people who make movies under 1.5 million dollars, generally, that's they're the ones who are on Ink Tip, the, the ones that you really have a chance of actually getting anywhere with. So, if you've got a genre movie, a horror movie, or something like that, you know, it's probably worth spending a little bit of money to throw something on Ink Tip because something might happen. Um, you know, Blacklist, uh, you know, they they do a fine job. You know, the industry does pay attention to blacklist and you know if you get a good score on a script on blacklist uh you know that is one way to introduce you to the town so so these mechanisms do exist and sure they they cost money i mean it's a capitalist society welcome to the world but uh they're out there you can avail yourselves of them uh, you know once you've got a great piece of material take advantage of them but um that's not that's not um that's not our gifts we're here to help you get to the point where your script is good enough to get a nine on blacklist. Right. On to the next one. What's the best way to leverage recognition at a screenplay competition? Oh, interesting. Well, um, uh, Anna, you read for a bunch of, a bunch of competitions. What do you think? Um, it's interesting because the, um, sometimes I think, you know, they, they have an enormous amount of impact and sometimes I think they don't. <laughs> uh, some of the managers I've talked to, my manager has always been like, yeah, there are a couple I pay attention to, but not really overall. On the other hand, I know like the slam dance winners, uh, for example, a lot of them go into production or they wind up with other deals and things like that. So um, what I did back in the days when I was actually submitting to contests instead of, instead of um, working for a lot of them uh, is that you know, any recognition I got would immediately go into a query letter. <laughs> uh, if you if you win a contest, you're likely to get a lot more notice. You know, if you won Big Break, for example, you know, you'd be in the trades and you would probably start getting phone calls right away. Yeah. Um, if you can't or if you if you come in, you know, if you got second rounded in, on, in the Nickel Fellowship, for example, that's actually pretty, pretty good with, you know, they get what, 15,000 scripts a year. Now, to, just to make it to the top 10% is really a, a, a really good sign that you know what you're doing. So you could easily say, hey, you know, this script was this script was top 10% at nickel. Uh, you know, I, would you like to take a look? So that, it really can just be an opening. I mean, more than anything, I think uh, uh, for the average writer who who submits to these contests, you know, if you get a, if you get anywhere, it's a good way to kind of say, hey, look, someone else liked this script as well. So maybe you should take a look at it. Uh, if you are, you know, if you have gotten a little further along in this, in the contest process and you, you make it to the semifinals, you make it to the, you know, the final rounds and stuff, I think you probably have a few more options. You'll probably get noticed a little more. I mean, I know that, um, you know, managers and, and assistants and, and agents assistants and things like that will, will seek out, you know, they'll want, they'll want the top 10, they'll want the top 20 scripts from any given major contest. And I think there are what, five or six major contests now. Uh, beyond Blacklist, which has their rolling thing. It's, you know, it's Nickel, um, the fellowships like the ABC Universal Fellowships, Austin, uh, Script of Palooza, and uh, yeah. Slam Dance big, and Big Break. Big oh, Break. And the Page Awards, too. So and those are pretty much the big ones. Yeah, and, and the major, as you said, the major contests, there, there is a, not all contests are created equal. And, um, you know, right. If you get top 10 in some contest nobody cares about, it honestly is not likely to do you any good. Yeah. You, you can put it in a query letter and people probably aren't going to care, honestly, because they'll just, you know, if you send it to a manager and you say, you know, uh, I, I, I'm top 10 for, you know, the S South Terre Haute uh, screenwriting competition and film festival, they will yawn and delete your email because, you know, they'll say, well, come back to me when, you know, you're a finalist in um, in uh, slam dance or, or you know, tie or, or a winner. I, I mean, look, you know, these people, they only have so much bandwidth. And by these people, of course, I mean the industry, they only have so much bandwidth. So they tend to only pay attention to a certain number of things. And that tends to be those contests that Anna just mentioned. At, and if you do well at a very high level. If you're not there yet, keep trying. 
And right. we have a next question related to this one. When do you know your script is ready to send out? Have a whole video on this. Just uh, go to our webpage, coverageinc.com, uh, click on the videos um, and watch our video on that. Um, let's move on, next question. <laughs> All right, earlier this year I got a consider with reservations for script, but since then I've gotten two passes. Have I made my script worse by doing the notes or was the reader the only one who got my script? <laughs> uh, yeah. Interesting. Okay. That's not that's actually a fairly common question. I mean, we get that once in a while. I think the 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 fact is that, you know, different readers different readers, uh, you know, are going to connect with different things is a lot of it. Uh, I don't think that you can make a script worse by taking the notes. Uh, that, you know, if you're uh, I'm trying to say, figure out a way to say this without sounding harsh. If you're taking the notes and you're, you know, and, and the right and the reader did a good job of expressing what's wrong with the script or what's not working for them, uh, it can only improve. So it, it could just be a question that 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 particular reader had a connection with it that um, the next readers did not. So it's unfortunately there isn't really an objective, a purely empirical objective way of reading a script, everyone who reads it's going to have a different a different take on it. What I love is not what Jim loves; is not what Tanya loves. You know. And that and that that sort of inherent, uh, you know, flaw in the system is really frustrating to people. Believe me, we understand. We're all writers ourselves. We all send out our own scripts for coverage, and you know, we we experience this ourselves all the time. Yeah, it's really irritating. Yeah, I mean, there is no sort of standardized. You know, if you do this, that, and the other thing, then you will get a consider. I, I wish that was the case, but you know, as as standardized as our readers tend to be in terms of making sure everybody kind of has the same levels of education, they understand myth, they understand you know all 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 the basics of screenwriting and, and you know pilot writing. Uh, it doesn't mean that one thing is going to work for for everybody. It, it might not. Um, it may also mean that, you know, sometimes when you rearrange the deck chairs a little bit, it creates a ripple effect and that you might not even uh, have realized that, you know, you might have caused some other problems elsewhere in the script by addressing some notes earlier on. So, I mean, it's, it is possible that the script did, quote, get worse, unquote may not be worse you know objectively speaking but it might have caused some other problem that that the writer is not even uh aware of and this can really only be sussed out by um getting more notes done really right. and you know and it also applies to you know out, out and out in the industry as well scripts you know what appeals to one production company isn't going to appeal to another one of my favorite stories is when uh lawrence kasdan took the big chill out which is a great drama and everybody should see it um, couldn't get it sold, and this was after writing Rage of the Lost Ark and The Empire Strikes Back. And I think they took it to something like 56 different production companies and studios, and he couldn't get it sold because everyone thought of him as this large action movie writer. Nobody wanted a little ensemble drama, you know. So it's it's not just us; it's everybody. <laughs> All right. Well, I think we have time for one more time. Yes, I think we do. Where is the best part in a script to reveal some background about a character that explains their behavior throughout the script? I revealed the issue in the last act near the end. Is it too late? Some people read my script and don't understand why my character does the things she does until the end when I reveal why... Uh oh, the last part was cut off. Well, I'm assuming it means when I reveal why she does the thing she does. Okay, so okay, the, it's it's hard to say without reading the script because this is a type of thing that is probably execution dependent. But just generally speaking, we like to really set up and define our characters as well as possible in in act one so that we know who we're going on the journey with and we can have a rooting interest um so that doesn't mean that the character can't change or surprise us by being something that we did not expect later in the script that's that's perfectly fine um so again it's really hard to say without reading the script but i think if if the reader feels confident or comfortable that that 
they're, that the protagonist, that they understand this person, that in act one, we've had the requisite scenes. Uh, it's called hero in their known world in mythological parlance. And that simply means showing this person before the actual journey of the movie begins, uh, you know, at home with family going about the day to day. Who is this person? Let's get to know this person. What do we need to know about this person? What are, what do they like to do? What are their, what's their dramatic flaw? What is their big problem? What are they having trouble achieving or getting? The more information we can get about this character, um, you know, the more we'll sort of relax and go on the journey with them. If we're missing that stuff and only learning this towards the end, then people are not really going to going to want to go on that journey. Um, however, you know, if you if you flip the tables and reveal that what we thought all along is completely wrong and it's something else entirely, that could work brilliantly. Uh, as, just as long as the seeds are planted, so that we can go. Oh, that's why this happened at the end. And then we'll go, cool, good on you, writer. But again, execution dependent. Uh, yeah. Anybody else want to add anything on that one? No, I mean, I think I think you're right. I mean, I think a lot of it also depends on if it's, is it meant to be a surprise or is it meant to inform the character? You know, if, if it's a big reveal, like the usual suspects or something like that, then yeah, it makes sense that we don't see it till the end. If it's if it's something that's going to tell us, you know, establish character and help us connect with them, we need it earlier. But exactly. Yeah. yeah if, it, if it's a reveal, that's one thing. If it's just we're we're just hiding information and then we only learn about it at the end and it seems arbitrary or doesn't seem motivated, um, that's less good. Yeah. Excellent. So that was our last question Yay. for the hour. Because we're yeah, trying to right. actually keep these to an hour since in the past we were quite bad about that. So uh, thank you all very much for uh, participating. And remember, you can always email us. Um, we're here to help. That's what we're here for. So uh, thank you, Anna. Thank you, Jim. And uh, info at coverageinc.com. If anybody has anything they didn't get to ask us uh, in this webinar, just uh, shoot us an email and we'll be happy to address it. Thank you so much, guys, and have a wonderful weekend.